Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for a, a new edition of our Future of Entertainment series here at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. I'm very excited to welcome John Fithian, the president and CEO of the National Association of Theater Owners. John, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read a little bit of your bio, just the first half. Um, John assumed the post of president and CEO of uh, the National Association of Theater Owners in January 2000. During more than 20 years in office, Fithian has helped guide movie theater owners through recent challenges facing the exhibition industry, including massive difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic, technological developments such as digital cinema, movie theft, government oversight of the movie rating system, preservation of the theatrical window, and relationships with the creative production and distribution communities. He serves as the chief public spokesperson for theater owners before public officials in the press. So thank you so much, John. Um, just right there in your bio, there is so much to talk about. Um, but I guess <clears throat> the, the first thing I just wanted to do was to put, put NATO into context um, in the sense that, you know, when I hear that acronym, your organization is what comes to mind first. Uh, but I know that that's <laughs> not, not necessarily the case for everyone. So tell us a little bit about like why NATO was created um, and what its, what its goals were. Sure. Well, if you think of our NATO first, it means you are clearly in the movie biz because uh, I get press questions all the time about what our policies are in Bosnia. We actually had one uh, bomb threat at our offices in LA years ago. People thinking that we were the other NATO, but we are not. We're just a little trade association uh, called the National Association of Theater Owners. And I've, I've actually tried to change the name over the years of my tenure because we are very much an international association. We have members in 103 countries around the world. Uh, we have members in all 50 states in the United States, and they range from the biggest companies that you've heard of, like Regal or Cinemark or AMC or out there on the West Coast, Pacific Arclight, companies like that, um, down to hundreds and hundreds of smaller mom and pop operators that may have one or two movie screens in a small town somewhere um, and everything in between. And, and the, the concept of, of forming a, a national, now international trade body is to represent the operators of motion picture theaters on issues of common concern. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we don't get into competitive issues. We don't tell them what ticket prices to set. We don't tell them which movies to book and which studios to partner with. Uh, that's all up to individual companies. Uh, if we got engaged in those issues, uh, the antitrust lawyers would come running after us. What we do work on, though, are issues of common concern. So if the government has a proposal that affects the movie going industry negatively or positively, we work on that uh, at the federal level, at the state and local level, uh, some international governmental issues as well. We work on the setting of standards for technology. You know, what's the future of projection and how did the conversion from film to digital technologies work? Uh, we're partners on the movie rating system with the Motion Picture Association and setting the rules here in the United States for how movies get rated in a voluntary system to give parents information about what's in the content of movies. Um, we represent the industry before the press. Uh, we deal with, with inquiries about the industry that might be in the form of litigation or regulatory uh, burdens. Um, and then lastly, as the bio suggested, a big part of what we do is work with the creative community. That's why we have an office out there in mm -hmm. LA, even though currently today I'm in Washington, DC, spent a lot of time in LA as well. And we work with the directors and the actors and the guilds and um, anybody that's interested in how movies are shown theatrically, uh, we, we engage with. So it, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a fun job. It's a, it's a great, passionate group of members who love showing movies. I mean, you have to love it to be in the movie business because, you know, your job typically ends at two o'clock in the morning on a Friday and Saturday nights. So if you, if you run theaters, it's because you love movies and you love getting people out to the cinemas. And that's why it's fun to represent them. Um, so I, I thought we, we should probably talk, uh, sort of on the, the most contemporary thing right now with theaters reopening, closing, reopening again. Uh, and then we can sort of dig into some of the other components of, of what NATO does. But um, 
I was I was on the AMC website yesterday because uh, they they offered to extend the moratorium on my A list uh, right. subscription until July. That sucks. So uh, first of all, that uh, that that's <laughs> that was very sad because you know it implies that um, AMC in California will not be reopening for a while, and I had been going to see some things in Thousand Oaks and in uh, Orange County, you know, when, when the, the, those counties were, were a little bit more open. Um, but I was looking through where theaters are open and it looks like AMC has theaters open everywhere except for California, New York and DC um, and probably some metropolitan areas that, you know, I wasn't really scrutinizing because I don't live there, but, um, can you tell us a little bit about where things stand? Because uh, in terms of overall exhibition um, being available and open, because uh, obviously New York and LA, massive, massive markets. Um, you look at the, the box office grosses and it still looks as low as it's been uh, throughout the pandemic. Not sure if that's because people aren't going back to theaters uh, or the content just really isn't, uh, you know, luring people to the movie experience. Um, where, where are we at in terms of theaters reopening? Yeah, Alex, a, a, a complex and multi-layered uh, series of questions you got there. Um, so just, just to back up a step, 2019 was this great kind of record-breaking year, right? Globally, we sold $42 billion worth of tickets. Uh, we, it was like the sixth or seventh year in a row. We had done more than 11 billion here in the U.S. And life was good. People said that, you know, for years, movie theaters were going to die because of television and then VHS and then DVDs and then streaming. And lo and behold, people discovered they like watching movies everywhere. People who watch movies at home are movie lovers of movies and cinemas too, and vice versa. And so we were rolling right along doing uh, just really strong, uh, stable business all around the world uh, until March of 2020. And then something that we've never experienced in our history happened. We were uh, forced to shut down quickly all around the world, actually beginning in January in China and then migrating with the path of the virus west until we shut down in the U.S. in, uh, in mid to late March. And that's never happened before in the 100 and whatever 20 year history of this industry. I mean, we shut down for a day or two for natural disasters or a war, but um, just to be completely shut down all around the world for months on end uh, is, is very strange. And we went quite a few months here in the US with no cinemas open anywhere. And then due in part to a lack of national guidance, I mean, the Trump administration just did nothing to send out consistent recommendations to states on how they carefully reopen society. For our business, like everyone else, it was a complete hodgepodge of rules. Um, some you know, states that were fairly conservative tried to open up really fast, like Georgia, and the pandemic first wave was still roaring. And we said, you know, I'm not really sure we want to open up yet. Um, other places like New York City have been closed continually since March 20th. Um, bizarrely, the state of New Mexico has decided to stay closed the entire time, whereas right next door in the state of Arizona, we've sold a fair amount of movie tickets. So the lack of national policy guidance meant that this hodgepodge of rules and regulations existed all across the country. So we actually sat down to try and design uniform health and safety policies on our own, because the government just wasn't giving us any help. And we hired uh, three leading epidemiologists um, to consult with, and we developed a set of protocols called Cinema Safe. You can check them out online. They're really comprehensive. Um, they involve every aspect of going to the movies, and we can talk about the protocols in a bit if you want to. But the idea was to, to demonstrate to moviegoers, regardless of where you go, you can rely on a standard set of health and safety protocols that will keep you safe when you're going to the movies. Uh, and almost all of the major operators in the U.S. adopted these policies. In fact, some foreign country governments liked our policies so much they took them and wrote them into law in some countries overseas. Um, and so these protocols gave, gave the chance for us to say, you can come back carefully and safely 
And indeed, we haven't had one reported case of transmission of the virus in a cinema in the US uh, since the beginning of our reopening. Nonetheless, we still are confronted with this massive patchwork of regulations. And so I've spent a ton of money and a ton of time with lobbyists in every state capital trying to go through the protocols of how you can reopen a cinema. Um, and we've worked with all the major movie studios there in LA because they keep postponing all their major titles to later in the schedule because they need a national footprint, right? You don't want to open a gigantic blockbuster without New York and LA open. That's just economically, that's really, really challenging. Um, so we're still working on it, to be honest. We have la less than half the cinemas in the US are currently open. Um, it's worse in Europe because of the rate of the second pace of the virus. But as the numbers of, of uh, the pandemic go down and as the number of the vaccines go up, um, states are starting to open up, right? So Chicago opened up about three weeks ago for us. Boston just opened up. Uh, now the newest are Seattle and Portland in the Pacific Northwest. So all across the country, we're starting to reopen cinemas uh, carefully um, in those territories where they were closed. In some territories, they've been open for a long time, but, uh, but we're still waiting on New York and LA. Um, in New York, honestly, I'm incredibly frustrated with Governor Cuomo. Uh, he's opened up restaurants in New York City. He's opened up um, indoor amusement centers. Uh, he's opened up arenas with testing protocols and not movie theaters. Um, so, you know, there may be a lawsuit coming in the very near future in New York because we're, we're just fed up not being able to open up in New York City. In California, the numbers are all based on, uh, sorry, the rules are all based on numbers. And Governor Newsom has very carefully articulated what it takes to get from those color categories that you're probably very familiar with and how, what does it mean to get out of purple and get into the next color. And as you go through those colors of, of the numbers dropping, you can start to reopen cinemas first at 25% capacity and then at 50 and it ramps up. And we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic that with the recent numbers in California, we're gonna start opening up in California county by county relatively soon. Um, and it's bizarre, but I think LA may be open before New York, but we'll see. Um, listen, man, I'm just looking for Ventura County. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, you've, you've done all of this all of this work and, you know, uh, let's assume that things work out in terms of the, um, the government uh, restrictions easing up, but you still have the, the, the sort of um, hearts and minds PR campaign to wage with the patrons of the theaters. And um, I'm obviously a bad case example because I, I would, you know, I was at, this first showing of Tenet when it came out, you know? So um, how- Thank you. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, absolutely. Um, I mean, like I waited until my second experience to actually buy popcorn, which I know is incredibly important for the, the health of the, uh, of the exhibition industry. But, um, but by, the, by the second or third film, I was a full blown, you know, concessions, just, you know, getting a, uh, a seat in the back row. Um, what I wanted to know though is what are you doing on the PR side to um, transmit all of this information to the public in terms of how you know, you've done very careful work with scientists to ensure their safety. I mean, um, it's, it's sort of like, uh, I guess it's, I'm not getting a whole lot of these messages because maybe I'm not in a market where right now that's all that important. So what, what's going on? Yeah, it's a really good question. So when we when we finalized the cinema safe protocols, um, I then took him to Dr. Fauci and kind of got his blessing too. Um, and we got the backing of not just the epidemiologists that we worked with, but a lot of scientists. And so then we started a campaign in those states where we were allowed to open to describe the fact that we were open safely and here's why and to get people to go look at the cinema safe website um and we dumped a bunch of money in the promotional campaign and it really started to work and people were starting to figure it out and then the second wave of the virus came and then there was really no use continuing to promote this because it, people just weren't coming anymore and we got shut down again in a lot of territories 
So it's probably time to, to restart that messaging campaign. I mean, the first time around, we did dozens and dozens and dozens of local interviews all across the country on news channels trying to talk about these protocols. Um, some of our studio partners have helped us by promoting the protocols as they promoted their movies. Um, but frankly, in California, you guys have been shut down so often because Californians just couldn't get their, you know, social distancing together and your mask wearing and can control your virus numbers. So you haven't seen much of the messaging because there hasn't been any open theaters to, to message toward, right? Uh, but what we will start that up again. The, the second most important part of, of the marketing though is, is joint with the studios about the fact that we're open and there are movies. The lack of major national advertising campaigns for blockbuster titles is kind of a, an indirect signal to the consumer that it's not safe to come back to the theaters yet, right? Because they're not they're not seeing the type of ads they used to see, and I'm not I'm not blaming the studios for not spending money on pictures they're not releasing. But but as we go through the next few months and we ramp up to a really good slate of movies by the late summer and into the fall, and the advertising campaigns come back, the combination of customers learning about our safety protocols and getting vaccinated and also seeing movie advertisements will all work together to drive people back to the cinema. We will also add a layer of, it's time to come back to the cinemas campaign. I mean, beyond the health and science of the protocols, uh, we're working on a campaign of, you know, come back to the movies and it's fun. And aren't you tired of being cooped up and that kind of stuff? Because we think, we think beyond kind of the film buffs like yourself, that there are just millions and millions of people who are sick and tired of being in their homes, right? Um, there, are, there are teenagers that really want to go out. There are families that, you know, want to do stuff as families. There are, there are groups of friends that want to do something other than just rent the pot of a movie theater as we're doing in lots of states right now. We think there's a gigantic pent up demand. So if we can get enough people vaccinated, get the virus numbers down, uh, and get the movies back in a big way, uh, we think there's going to be a massive resurgence of movie going, but it's, it's all got to be timed and messaged mm -hmm. together. Um, I want to, and bear with me as I sort of work my, my, my way through this question. We're talking to some extent there about blockbusters driving um, attendance. Um, and that's great for the, I mean, that's specifically for the, those big national chains, um, you know, your Cinemarks and Regals and, you know, AMC and Pacific. But what I, what I uh, I'm also really interested about is how does your work sort of differ when it's more about art house theaters because you've got this, I think, kind of an interesting um, dilemma, which is art house, uh, you know, the, the like people who go to the art house, the most like reliable audience tends to be older. That means they're the most at risk. That also means they're the first to get vaccinated. So how is that playing out? Because those, there's no shortage of films that could be filling an art house right now. Right. And in fact, we've had really decent art house movies in our theaters kind of throughout the pandemic. I mean, except for the early months when we were just closed everywhere. Um, we've had a lot of great pictures from Focus and Fox Searchlight mm -hmm. and Bleecker and A24. And uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, and then some smaller titles from the major studios too, right? Universal's been pumping in movies and mm -hmm. uh, so, so has uh, Warner Brothers and Disney's got a few coming out. And it's not that, not that we haven't had any movies at all. Uh, and we have had quite a few smaller independent titles. But the reason why I focused on the blockbuster advertising is that that tells people movie cinemas are open, mm -hmm. right? You don't have, you don't have gigantically expensive national campaigns for independent film. Uh, but what you need for people to discover independent film is knowledge that their local movie theater is probably going to be open and that it's safe to come back. And the, the cinema safe protocols do the second part of that once people hear about it. But the national advertising campaigns tell people that their cinemas, that their theaters are open. We've, we've done surveys every week across the country and, and we, <laughs> At one point in this thing, we had more people that knew about our safety protocols than knew that their cinemas were open in states where they were open. Wow. So what good did it do to know that we were, had these great safety protocols if they thought their cinemas were closed? And the way you get beyond that is with the... So I didn't mean to suggest that we only promote the blockbusters. It's just that those, 
those ads tell people your cinema is open, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and then on, but then on the art house uh, attendees, you're right that a lot of those skew on the senior side, not always, but a lot do. And we have hundreds of members that show art film um, and they're, they are going to get vaccinated first. Right. And, and I got a, um, you know, I've got a, a, a mother who's vaccinated and I've got some older relatives who are vaccinated and they're ready. I mean, they are, they're ready to go do something. So that's, that's a, that's a good phenomenon for us. The last part of this on this long answer, sorry, is that we also believe that when younger people know that grandma's no longer in danger, that they'll come back in greater numbers, perhaps probably even before they're vaccinated, right? Uh, a lot of our very frequent moviegoers in the late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, they don't, they don't have a sense of, of the same kind of personal fear of the virus, but they really don't want to make their grandma sick. So as you don't have to, my point is you don't have to get to, you know, 80, 90% vaccination rates before people feel more comfortable coming out and doing things as the most vulnerable get vaccinated. Everybody feels a bit more comfortable about, about coming out carefully um, for activities. Well, let's talk a little bit about the protocols because I am also um, interested in knowing basically how the protocols affect in the, the more like individual theaters. So, so, you know, a company like AMC, what resources do they have to put these into effect versus a company like Lemley, where, you know, it's a much smaller um, group of independent theaters. Like how, how sustainable is it for an art house theater versus on the massive scale of something like AMC? Yeah, well, um, first, there's not that much difference in in the ability to absorb costs if you're an AMC versus a tiny independent, because the amount of money it costs to equip one cinema is the amount of money it costs to equip one cinema, right, or train one group of people. Um, we are we are a location by location business, and it's not like AMC can create one fix that they buy once and it works everywhere. You're talking about putting money into each location. Yes, there are some economies of scale for the big circuits and buying uh, supplies and doing developing training programs. And so there's some cost savings, but um, but it's expensive for everybody mm -hmm. to do this right. Nonetheless, we know we have to do it right. And so uh, what the safety protocols involve is everything about going to the movies. From the very beginning, where you can book your tickets online, uh, they're very sophisticated algorithms that, that ensure social distancing as you book your tickets as a group. So you book online, you can have your group sit together, automatically blocks off the requisite number of seats and spaces around you to create uh, social distancing. This all works within capacity limits of what's allowed in that territory. Um, social distancing is required strongly everywhere else. Like you walk into the cinema, uh, there's signage and descriptions of social distancing requirements. We have trained our staff to help people understand that in restrooms. Um, we've changed the way concessions can be purchased and how they're how they're handled in order to speed it up, reduce contact, that kind of thing. Um, there's a range of protocols for cleaning that didn't exist before the pandemic. Um, and then very importantly, and for a while controversially, is the mask policy, which basically means you come into our cinemas, you're wearing a mask and um, you can take it off when you are in your seats, ready for the movie and you're eating your popcorn or drinking your, your, your soda, right? Um, but otherwise you gotta have your mask on. And, and that's scientifically driven because of how the transmission of the virus occurs. And when you're sitting in a cinema, everybody facing forward, the chance of transmission is much reduced compared to in a lobby facing each other at one of our concession stands or restaurants or bars or even in the restroom when you're crowded together. Um, that's it, the mask wearing is absolutely essential in all those locations. But it, the, the risk level in a cinema auditorium is much reduced, A, because people aren't generally talking, singing, shouting, exercising. They're just watching a movie, right? So if you think about it, it's a lot safer than being in some churches where people are singing and shouting and passing contribution plates down the aisle. It's safer than being in gyms where people are exercising, increasing their breathing rate, spewing out the particles. It's safer than being in a restaurant where people are sitting around a table facing each other with their masks off because they're eating and 
talking back and forth. So um, I had learned all this stuff from the epidemiologists. I didn't, didn't, didn't figure this out myself. But anyway, those protocols are all, all there all in place. Also, finally, uh, air filtration and, and ventilation, really important. Changing the amount of outdoor air you bring into the auditorium versus recycling the air. Um, the range of throw between the, you know, we used to say throw in relationship to the projector of the screen. Now we're talking about throw in relationship to our, our ventilation systems in the auditorium. Um, some companies are changing out new types of filters, that kind of thing. So this is all part of Cinema Safe. You can see it online. The last thing I'll say, though, is that as, as, as comprehensive as this was, then the science all changes. Now, apparently, a bunch of the stuff that we're doing on cleaning really isn't probably even necessary. Because every what people thought at the beginning of the pandemic about transmission uh, is totally different now. And it's it's almost all about the masks and the air, and it's not as much about the cleaning. So now we've brought the task force and the epidemiologists back and talking about how to evolve this stuff. That was a really long answer, but I, I promise you a lot went in to develop these safety protocols. I, I remember washing my groceries. <laughs> so. Right? Nobody does that anymore. That's I mean. Um, so I, I was curious if you were also involved, if if um, if drive-ins are sort of under the umbrella of NATO as well. Yes, they are. Um, there are over 600 vibrant, wonderful drive-ins in the United States of America. People seem to forget this. Um, there is a separate group that represents just drive-ins as well, but they're all part of our group too. Mm -hmm. um, and man, what a resurgence some of these drive-ins had. Oh, I mean. <laughs> Agreed. So some of the business coming out of drive-ins, particularly in the hardest part of the pandemic, is is phenomenal. And that's great. People rediscovered a different way of watching movies outside their home and um, good on them. I mean, we had a lot of members with closed indoor theaters throwing up parking lot drive-ins all across the country just to try mm -hmm. to accommodate demand when they when they couldn't stay open inside. Well, actually, that's that's um, something I really wanted to ask you about, which is you know, in LA, I'm sure you know, uh, driving to Vineland and City of Industry on a Friday afternoon is one of the most torturous things you could possibly do uh, because it's east at rush hour on a weekend. Um, but obviously Vineland is wonderful. You know, I'm always thrilled when I get to go there, but it, the distance, I mean, these, these drive-ins are pretty far in LA. So there have been some really cool pop-up theaters, right. drive-in theaters, closer to home. The American Legion has one here in Hollywood that, that uh, I've been to. Uh, I've been to the Santa Monica airport. But the one thing I wanted to ask on that note, besides like how is that regulated, is, um, uh, is how, how are they programmed? Because they're not playing the same films. And, and so if I wanted to see um, like uh, Freaky, which Universal put out in, back in November, I'd have to go to, dry, to, to Vineland. I'd have to go to a, a full-time drive-in versus, you know, the pop-ups are playing repertory films that, um, you know, obviously are, are, are meant to appeal to the most amount of people to really, uh, you know, fill the lot every time. But um, I'm just curious, is that, is that a... Uh, some sort of a regulation or are they just doing it purely because they know that they're going to make more money if they play elf than wonder woman so it's not a yes or no answer mm -hmm. um there's no uh law that requires a certain type of cinema to show a certain type of movie but there are all kinds of intellectual property contract rules that govern this and the distributors of the movies license their movies to be shown in places where they want them shown, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got a big expensive production on a movie that's just coming out, you don't really want it to look like crap on the side of a barn. Um, you want it to be projected right. And you want it to meet the so-called DCI specs. And you want it to be secure. You don't want a new movie out in an environment where somebody's going to rip it off and put it online as pirated product. So there, there are all kinds of uh, concerns in the distributors about where they book their movies to make sure that they're booked uh, appropriately. Some distributors change those rules during the pandemic. It's like, well, in such and such a state, there aren't any indoors open anyway. So you want to throw it up on a barn, throw it up on a barn. Others did not. Um, that's a difficult definitional issue for us because a lot of the 
people throwing on movies on the side of barns aren't members of ours because they're not usually in the business and other people are who are members and they're saying you know why don't you wait until the movie comes out for real and we're allowed to open and so there was, there's a lot of debate about this during the pandemic but uh, it'll settle back into a norm as you know as every place is allowed to open carefully and and, and we get back into having regular drive-ins and, and regular indoor theaters but it, the good news about all this is that it showed that people just wanted to get out of their homes and watch movies, right? That desire, everybody says, you know, streaming has now killed the movie theater and the idea of collective experience. Um, something happened to my video. Hold on one second. Yeah. There we go. I oh, got a got a camera bug or something. Um, and and what what these efforts showed is that people just like going out of their homes and watching movies with other people, however they can pull it off. So that, that's a good sign for us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what was in the, the, um, the, the COVID stimulus for theaters? Because there was a lot of sort of buzz around it, but I'm honestly not always, I don't go as deep into articles as I should these days. And uh, yeah. you could just bring us up to speed. So I hear, my 18 year old daughter, if she were here whispering in my ear, dad, don't give the half an hour answer to this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really complicated and layered. And there have been multiple stimulus bills and we're lobbying one right now as we speak. Indeed, it's what I was doing earlier today. Um, so first you go way back to the CARES Act, which passed in March of last year. And that had stuff in it that was important to us that had uh, extended unemployment compensation for our furloughed workers. I mean, when this thing started, we furloughed 153,000 employees. It's just awful, right? Um, it had so-called PPP loans for some of our small business operators, um, but it didn't have anything substantial to really help the movie theater industry. So we lobbied like crazy uh, for a couple of other provisions. Um, and the biggest one came in a bill enacted in December, which was originally called Save Our Stages, which was about live venue operators, right? People have small music clubs and comedy clubs and that kind of thing. They got it started. They got Senator Chuck Schumer from New York, very powerful senator on board. Um, they got bipartisan sponsorships. And we went to them and said, hey, movie theaters got clobbered too. Can we join your bill? And they said, we've got 10 billion you bring us 5 billion, you can join our bill. So we literally lobbied all of Congress and, and it, was, uh, it was so reassuring to see the industry step up because I asked, <laughs> I'm not gonna name them because I'm not sure they wanna be named, but I asked so many big name film directors to make calls for us, uh, studio executives um, who probably don't wanna be named either, who know the right members of Congress. Um, Hollywood was on the phone Send in text, write in letters. Uh, we did have one big published letter with over a hundred major movie directors on it saying, hey, you gotta do something to save movie going as an art form and a business in America. Um, and Congress listened and the Save Our Stages Act passed. Uh, $15 billion in grant money for uh, mid-size and smaller movie theater operators and live venues. A couple concerns about it. Uh, one is it didn't cover our biggest companies. We tried to get the biggest companies covered, but Congress didn't want to help publicly traded companies. So companies like Regal and Cinemark and AMC were not covered. Um, so we have lobbied for tax benefits for them, which I won't bore you with. Uh, but the concept is if you lost a bunch of money because of the pandemic, you should get breaks on taxes in other years uh, because it's not your fault you had to close, right? So the government's going to give you a tax refund uh, I'll save the details, worth a lot of money to the bigger companies as well as the smaller ones. So we lobbied for that. Um, now, this in this bill that's pending right now that was proposed originally by President Biden and is moving through the House of Representatives, there's a bunch of stuff in there we care about. Um, there's more money for that grant program because even though $15 billion sounds like a lot of money, there's a whole bunch of people signing up for it and there's not enough money to cover everybody. So we're getting some more money in this piece of legislation for the grant program. We are trying to protect these tax benefits that our larger companies need to stay alive. Um, and we're trying to extend the unemployment compensation for, uh, for our workers all at the same time. So each, each piece of legislation has had a lot in it. 
Um, watching legislation be made is like watching sausage be made. You don't want to see how it happens. But uh, but I got to tell you, as, as partisan and ugly as politics has been in this country, it is uh, reassuring to see our government step up and say, movie going is an important activity in America. These jobs are important. We're going to help you. And here are some tax breaks. And here are some grants. And it's it's uh, it's a good day for us in this industry for democracy when we actually get some support from the government. So um, our estimates were we'd have lost 70% of our operations uh, without these programs, right? Just cinemas would have closed, screens would have gone dark um, because we literally haven't had any revenues to speak of for a year. Uh, and, and Congress is stepping up to do the right thing. Need to get it implemented. The money hasn't started flowing yet. We're close, getting the regulatory process done. But hopefully the next month, Checks are going to start flowing into cinema operators around the country, and and uh, that'll tide them over till the business comes back. Um, do you feel like theaters in competitive markets are more or less susceptible to sur like surviving economically through this? What I mean is, people have been talking about theaters shutting down and not reopening, and I look around Los Angeles and I'm like, well, that'll never happen here you know, because it's Los Angeles, right? But, but maybe in a theater, in a, in a town where there is only one theater and, or two or something like that, it could feasibly be sort of something that the community rallies around and helps support, um, or the lack of competition for other screen space may make it more of a destination when it reopens. Is there a difference between markets in terms of uh, the, how the theaters are going to rebound? Uh, theaters and markets of all sizes were endangered by this pandemic, right? I mean, you can't lose 85% roughly of your revenues for a year mm -hmm. in a marginal business and stay alive for long without government help. So we're going to lose some, we're going to lose some locations. We already have, right? We've already lost either smaller independents in small towns that may, maybe it was the only cinema that operated there, uh, but we've lost operations from the biggest companies. I mean, AMC and, and Cinemark and Regal, these companies have shut down permanently some of their, some of their lesser performing uh, locations. Um, so it's not really big versus small companies or markets, kind of everybody got hit really, really, really hard. Um, nonetheless, the phenomenon you described of a community stepping up to the plate to help rescue, that typically is something you see in small towns or something you see with independent theater operators, right? I mean, people don't uh, do a GoFundMe campaign to save their AMC. I wish they would, but they just, you know, they, they, there's more of a, um, a feeling of fidelity towards, towards, you know, the local cinema operator that you know, and, and there's, been, there's been a lot of that, too. Um, it doesn't, doesn't add up to the $15 billion we need from the federal government, but it, it does help. No, I mean, I, I heard stories of like small, small independent theaters were, were, were selling popcorn without, you know, having obviously theaters open and people were coming because they wanted to, they wanted to be able to fund things. Right. Um, have you found- Popcorn, popcorn, gift cards. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of our, some of our theater operators that had more than just concession service we're literally operating as a kind of a restaurant with people picking it up the food curbside and anything possible to keep the revenues coming in but e even with all of that um like i said we've lost you know 80 85 percent of our revenues so you know as i as i keep staring at your studio posters in the background there uh i do want to veer into a controversial topic uh well I was gonna I leave got, Lionsgate out of it, but <laughs> I got I gotta make sure every major studio is represented because they're all in this room. I promise you. I got one from each of them. <laughs> Just you, happens you, to be Disney and Warner Brothers right behind me right now. But I know Lionsgate, and it's particularly universal. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's particularly <laughs> interesting to me that those are the two that you, you've got back there because they're the ones that have moved a lot of their massive content onto their streaming platforms. And Universal, which was the villain of the early part of the pandemic, seems to have like 
somehow, whether it's right. because of Warner Brothers <laughs> or like um, the fact that they are releasing movies in theaters, whether it's through Focus or, or films like Freaky, um, I feel like the heat's been taken off Universal a little bit. Um, and of course, what I'm talking about is theatrical windows and debuting films on streaming, day and date, all sorts of changes that have been sort of held off from happening for a long time. Um, and I think that a lot of that is what we, what we hear often is this sort of the tension between what the exhibitor needs in terms of exclusivity versus what the distributor wants in terms of like global distribution all at once. Can you explain what theatrical windows have been in, you know, uh, historically and how that is changing and if it's for good? And, and I know those are wildly speculative questions. But hugely fundamentally important questions to the uh, business that I represent, right? So people in the industry know this intimately, so I apologize for the primer course, but theatrical exclusivity or windows is that period for a movie released to theaters where it's only in theaters before it goes to the home. And it can go to the home as premium video on demand or subscription or DVD sales or any number of ways a movie can be seen in the home. But the concept is what is that period of exclusivity before the first movie appears in the home somehow? And uh, this period has been shrinking uh, over the years that we've tracked it and we've tracked it for decades. Um, in part because the way people watch movies has changed, has changed, right? In the old days, a movie could stay in cinemas for months and months and months and months and months and months and kind of prints would be bicycled around the country and it would take forever for a movie to kind of get its return in the theatrical marketplace. With major uh, megaplexes and multiple auditoriums and multiple showtimes and, and these movies don't last at all like they used to. So in some sense, the shortening of the theatrical window is a natural part of how movie going has changed. Um, and that's fine because we offer our customers a much better service now than we did decades ago where they can have lots of showtimes and lots of choices and lots of formats. You can go in an IMAX, you can go in a luxury cinema, you can go 3D on some movies, although not so much anymore. You can go, you know, luxury recliners, high end, cheap, food and beverage is different. So there are lots of different ways to see movies close to or on opening weekend. So the, the length of the run, therefore the length of the window has shrunk over the years. Um, but it's always been honestly kind of this, this, this weird standoff between, between us who basically said this is fundamentally important to our business. And the reason why it's fundamentally important is that we do have a marginal business. Most of our patrons would still come to the cinema anyway, if the movie were available at the, in the home but some percentage wouldn't. And that percentage is enough to kill the profitability of cinemas. So if you just eliminated windows entirely, you, you'd kill a large number of cinemas here and around the world. Um, but the idea that there's a one size fits all window for every movie is crazy in my mind. It always has been, right? Um, some movies are gonna last a long time. Some movies aren't, you know, horror films go boom and blow up and then typically die quickly. Um, other movies might catch on and play forever and ever and ever and, and different movies could use different windows. And so there, there was pre pandemic, there was a serious amount of discussion between major exhibitors and major distributors about how to make the windowing system more sophisticated. Um, and there were lots of different concepts and Paramount experimented with one that didn't work very well. And um, others were talking about, you know, other windows and doesn't matter if it's PVOD because that's a higher price point, and less cannibalistic. If it goes straight to streaming, that's essentially free. That's kind of a different window analysis. So there are all these different variables out there about what type of what length of exclusivity would be the most, uh, the best for everybody growing the pie everywhere um, that were being discussed when the pandemic hit. Then the pandemic hit and it's like, uh, or not showing these movies in very many theaters doesn't matter how fast it goes to the home. Um, and so we, we talked to the major studios, smaller distributors too, about the question of what they did with their movies. Did they postpone them for later theatrical release? Did they keep them in the marketplace, but 
shorten their windows or eliminate them entirely so they can monetize their home release faster to make up for the losses they were sustaining in theatrical release. Um, and were the changes that they were making short-term changes for the pandemic or a precursor to longer-term changes in the business model? So really, really complicated question. Um, and lots of different companies did different things in response to that, right? Uh, the universal model was originally thought by many to be really radical and anti-exhibition. And then now, compared to Warner Brothers going day and date with all their movies for an entire year to HBO Max, people started to scratch their heads and say, this is, this is crazy. These, are, these models are all over the place. So I'll, I'll say a couple of things because it, what's appropriate for a model on a particular movie is between a distributor and exhibitor and trade association executive can't make that decision but it's different for movies that are playing in the pandemic. For distributors that are actually giving us movies when not that many people are coming to the theaters because we need movies to stay alive, there's an understanding that, that the Windows models are probably gonna be different in that environment because they gotta monetize their home stuff fast. But what of these models is actually about the future and not just about the pandemic is subject to heavy negotiation right now, right? So uh, Universal and their exhibition partners who have signed up for their new PVOD model, uh, AMC and then Cinemark evolved it a little bit more and others are signing on. That's a longer term model. That's not just a pandemic model. That's a way of saying we gotta be more sophisticated about our windows. Um, and, and, and there are different levels depending on how big the movie is likely to be now in that plan and also it's a window to pvod not streaming and pvod is less cannibalistic because it's a higher price point it's it's more value for a home show than just taking it straight to streaming right um the the warner brothers model is a pandemic model right we we don't i wish they hadn't done it for the entire year right. uh because we think the pandemic's basically going to be over for us halfway through this year or so but nonetheless, they've described it as a pandemic model. This is not me putting a label on their model. And Sarnoff has said this, right? So is Toby, uh, uh, Emmerich, so have others. It, it's, it's a model for the pandemic in order to keep movies and cinemas, but try to juice their HBO Max subscriptions. They're doing simultaneous release, but they do not intend to do that long-term. <laughs> they've made that very clear. So I would describe that as a pandemic model. So in, in each of these discussions, and Disney's had some you know, some, some interesting ones too. They took one big movie uh, out of theatrical entirely and move on. Uh, then other movies they've released simultaneously to theatrical and Disney Plus. And Raya is the next one where they're proposing to do that in early March. And that's a tough negotiation for a lot of our members too. So again, long answer, sorry, lots of stuff all over the map, but certainly the Windows models coming out of the pandemic will be better for exhibition than they are during the pandemic, mm -hmm. but they'll be shorter and more sophisticated than they were before the pandemic. Yeah. I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I mean, the Warner Brothers one was was so extreme. The idea that I, you know, I'll have waited all this time and then they're putting Dune on HBO Max in December of this year, you know, it's sort of like, isn't that gonna be, aren't we gonna be back? Well, why commit so far out? that that's where it starts to feel more like a uh, HBO Max subscription drive than uh, it is. It is an HBO Max subscription drive. They're not going to kid you about that. They know it is right. But on the other hand, for the right now and for the, and for the last couple of months, we've had some important Warner Brothers titles when we haven't had much of anything else. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you need movies during a pandemic, but, but, did they need to go the whole year? They didn't need to go the whole year, but nonetheless, we understand that a pandemic model is different than a long-term model. I'm seeing that we have a, a bunch of questions coming in from the audience. Do you have time to, to go through a few? Fire away. You Thank want you. me to read them or you want to pick the ones you want to read? Oh. Um, you going to uh, curate? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, oh, it's funny. Someone, uh, uh, yeah, so someone just <laughs> added that uh, there's no way if theaters are open that Warner Brothers doesn't release Dune exclusively in theaters. We'll see. Um, <laughs> but, uh, okay. I like that comment. Thank you. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, how does NATO... Wait, sorry. So here's the thing. is they, they, Some of these have come in, so I just want to make sure while we were talking, so I just want to make sure we're not being redundant. 
Um, okay, so is the theater business thinking about how to make movie going more social and eventized in the future as a way to get more uh, people out of the home into the theater? It seems like the death of the exclusivity window is written on the wall for the near future, but when I think about movie going as a kid, the social aspect was the most important part. Dressing up as a Harry Potter character with my friends, going to a midnight uh, at midnight to a premiere together. It seems like that's how theaters can keep the edge in the future. Do you agree? Yeah, except for the death of the window, as just discussed. Uh, the window's going to evolve, but it's not going to die. Um, eventizing going to the cinema is a big part of of what we've always wanted to do and in some ways um global releases of movies at the same time helps that right mm -hmm. because in the old days you'd event ties it you know in person only or in hard copy print now you eventize you, you gin up the stuff for eventizing events online and so to have a a global buzz about the big blockbusters or a national buzz about local movies build up in advance of the theatrical release is very important to our business. And, you know, we still do have to deal with lots of costume wearing for certain movies and we got to be careful about safety, but it's fantastic. And we still do have crazy midnight screening parties of movies before they open regularly the next day. And we try to maybe have just 200 runs of a big movie open on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night exclusively and then go bigger that weekend. And yes, eventizing and, and developing a social buzz about the movie release is very important to our business. And certainly will be when we come out of the pandemic. Because um, we love everybody talking about the same movie on, it used to be Monday morning, now it's Saturday morning. Everybody reads deadline on Saturday morning and knows exactly how the movie did on Friday night and it's either alive or dead by then. But yes, it's an event. We gotta keep doing that. Um, okay, this question actually is something I'm really curious about too, which is, can you give your thoughts on dynamic pricing? <laughs> and I was trying to like think about how, you know, when I, with my A-list, I actually, let's, let's, couple this with, with a question about subscription um, pricing, because I now subscribe to AMC A-List, and that's taken me away from going to the Arclight all the time. And I had a nice conversation with Ted Mundorf about this too. Like, <laughs> is, the, is the Arclight going to go subscription at some point? Um, but I often will now choose whatever the most expensive ticket is, you know, like, laser IMAX on a Saturday night, you know, and that covers the cost of my subscription to A-List for like the whole month. Um, so dynamic pricing, L let's talk a little bit, a bit about what that is. Um, what do you think of it? And how does that, how does that model help versus theaters going into a subscription model? Yeah. So first the legal preamble is that, uh, movie theater companies set their own ticket prices. And I don't tell them what to do in terms of setting their ticket prices, because if I do, I go to jail. And that's my wife's only rule for me is don't go to jail. Mm -hmm. So I'm not telling anybody what to do with their ticket prices, okay? That's that's the preamble. But just theoretically, um, I have believed for some time that the movie theater industry is way behind the curve on not doing dynamic pricing. Um, for years, we've done a little bit of dynamic pricing in the fact that we've had at lots of locations, maybe a Tuesday discount um, or a matinee discount or a senior citizen discount. And those are like little tiny steps into dynamic pricing. Um, but if you think about how they sell airline seats, um, wow, we, we're, we just don't do dynamic pricing at all in movie theaters, right? So you can do dynamic pricing based on the day the movie's shown, based on the time the movie's shown, you can do it based on, which we do do, based on how the movie's shown, more expensive premium large formats versus other formats, we do do that. Um, but you could do it on the movie itself, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, that's really controversial with some distributors because, oh my gosh, don't label my movie a $7 movie, my movie's a $15 movie. Um, so that gets a little tricky. And then, and then there's, 
dynamic pricing that's that's not just one ticket price for movie, but things like subscription or group buys or, mm-hmm. uh, or that kind of thing. Um, and I, I think we ought to be experimenting driving with all of it, um, particularly coming out of the pandemic. We want to get people back in. We want we want to entice people, you know, to realize what they've missed um, and offering them all kinds of different ways to buy tickets um, as a subscription program, uh, you know, to buy packages of tickets together, to have discount nights, to have discount movies, to I mean, maybe the third week in the movies run, the price comes down versus you want to, you want to see it opening weekend, pay for that big event. You want to save a little bit of money, wait two weeks. And there are so many different ways to, to give ticket pricing options to drive people back in. And I, I, I think we got to be more aggressive about it, but again, just theory, not, not individual company policy. There should also be some sort of like economy basic if you're stuck in the like the far left seat in the front row of like the Cinerama Dome. <laughs> but I think maybe- uh, Airlines do this. Yeah. I mean, what, is econ- what is economy plus? It's, you know, you can't afford business class, but I'm too tall to be stuck at coach and I want to go. Yes, we should be doing all that stuff. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this uh, uh, question from Kate. One of our one of our other guests uh, in this series mentioned that some closures, some theater closures, would actually be good because there are too many screens. Um, do you agree with this, or think that there's any silver lining to some of the closures? So there's going to be some closures. There's no doubt about it. And we've got what forty one thousand movie screens in the United States of America right now or auditoriums, we call it screens, but that's just how we count them. Um, is that too many? Maybe, right? But what we try to avoid is going to 20,000 or 10,000. What we try to avoid is is having markets that don't have great cinema options because the pandemic killed them. Um, so I think we're gonna get there with the government help. I, I, I think we won't lose you know, tens of thousands of screens, but we're gonna lose several thousand i don't know exactly how many um and that may not be a bad thing for the industry as a whole it sucks for the people that operate those screens i mean the managers that work there it's awful to retrench like that but but having a a little bit of a um a little bit of a wipe out of the least performing properties because the pandemic's not a bad thing for the healthy industry as a whole Um, Okay, this question is from JD. The end of the Paramount decrees didn't make much difference in part because it happened in the middle of a pandemic, Uh, but the percentage deal with Universal seems to point to relationships between studios and exhibitors. What do you think is the future of vertical integration? Wow. What's that, a USC law professor asking that question? Um, So the Paramount consent decrees were vitally important to the health of exhibition decades ago, right? There were real monopolistic practices of the studios back in the day because they own their own theaters and they hugely advantaged them and discriminated against everybody else. Um, vertical integration. And, and they conspired horizontally <laughs> on all kinds of policies. Um, those dangers don't exist today the same way they existed back then, um, at least not 100%, right? So so the, the risks of anti-competitive practices that were regulated by the Paramount Consent Decrees have dissipated over the years. doesn't mean that they were gone entirely. So what we did in working with the Justice Department, uh, we opposed the complete repeal of the Paramount Consent Decrees. We said a couple of the provisions were still kind of important. Um, and we worked with the Justice Department to make sure that they said, by repealing the consent decrees, we're not saying the activities specifically prohibited in those decrees are necessarily legal. They will still be judged by underlying antitrust law. So for you lawyers out there, the Sherman Act's still going to apply to this stuff, right? And the Clayton Act's still going to apply to this stuff. It's not that you wave a wand and all these practices are now legal. It's just that they're not specifically prohibited by a consent decree. And that's why the Justice Department went after them, because the Justice Department was trying to get rid of all consent decrees as a form of regulation. So we still have the underlying antitrust laws. If, you know, if, if studios tried to do something horribly on a competitive, we could still sue them with the underlying antitrust laws, even though the Paramount consent decrees are gone. Um, 
nonetheless, no doubt the Paramount consent decrees were more important to our smaller members than our bigger ones, because our bigger, with consolidation over the years, I mean, when, when the consent decrees were enacted, there weren't any theaters not owned by studios that had a lot of clout. They were all little independents. Today, the biggest circuits are uh, gigantic and operate in many countries and have a lot of clout. Um, so they can push back against anti-competitive practices from the studios. The little independents can't push back as well. And so for, for them, it's a little bit more of a risk and we'll watch closely to try to help protect them. And um, like I said, use the underlying antitrust laws uh, if we need to. But I don't view the repeal of Paramount Consent Decree as that big of a deal um, for, for changing practices in the industry. And there's another reason why that's the case. And this also relates to Windows. I'm gonna tie these two questions together. Yes, there are five or six major studios, depending on what you call a major studio. Um, I am the one that pronounced that Lionsgate was a major studio years ago. And so I think there are six now, but some people say there are five, whatever. But I think there's more like 10 or 12. And, and I say that because I think Apple definitely, Amazon maybe, and maybe even Netflix, are going to get into the theatrical business a lot bigger than they are right now. Um, and that's how competition continues. If, if the existing entrenched major studios just get ridiculous on Windows policies and eliminate them entirely or try to, or aren't playing fair on how they license their movies to our members, there are other players with big pockets out there that are looking at our space. And we are talking to Apple and Amazon and Netflix and others about, hey, you know, you got these big movies, why don't you give them a bigger shot of a theatrical run with the window before you take them exclusively to your service. Um, so we may have some more competition in there. That was a little bit of a curveball on your Paramount question. No, that's great because there was a, there was a question specifically about Amazon and Apple. In fact, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, early on, there was some headline a while back uh, that was around the time people were worried about um, AMC and bankruptcy that said Apple eyes buying AMC. And it was unclear if that meant the station, like the TV channel or the theater chain. Actually, I don't think I ever really understood which one it was, but um, what, I mean, it, it, yeah, can you clarify that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I could neither confirm nor deny any particular possible transaction in the business okay. because that's not my job as a trade association executive. I can tell you that, that um, anybody that's in the content business that has content of theatrical playability mm -hmm. may look at movie theaters as one way to make money, right? For, for Apple, it's all about driving stuff to their devices. For Amazon, it's all about prime customers. You know, for Netflix, it's all about subscriptions. So theatrical's never going to be their primary business. Mm -hmm. um, but it's silly to me that, that they don't want a couple hundred million bucks theatrically on a big picture before they juice their home services with it. I mean, why not, why not take both? I don't understand. I mean, I understand that. Um, we got, honestly, we got really close on Marty Scorsese's picture. Um, lots of discussions about how to make that a big theatrical release. Uh, Marty wanted it to be a big theatrical release. We just didn't quite get it done with Netflix. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not possible down the road. So I, I honestly believe these big tech companies are going to play more theatrical movies. Mm -hmm. Are they going to buy theatrical companies? Well, Netflix has already bought a bunch of independent cinemas yeah. just to show off their movies for awards contention. Um, I don't think Ted mm -hmm. wants to go into the business bigger than that, but who knows? And it seems like there's, I mean, I, I <clears throat> without being in the, uh, uh, in, in the industry myself, it seemed like it made a lot of sense for this partnership between the Egyptian American Cinematheque and Netflix, you know, cause one Netflix by having a venue, but then also supporting a nonprofit to be able to do what they do without necessarily the same financial burden that they were under before. Uh, wild speculation. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> um, great. Um, but, Ted really ought to be playing in more movies widely theatrically with some kind of window and making a lot of money before he juices his subscribers with it. You can have both, Ted. Come on, <laughs> let's talk. Um, uh, let's see, there's, there's a couple of questions that revolve around technology in the theaters, renovations that may or may not be happening, if, if that's 
something um, that's happening industry-wide, um, but I guess more uh, looking towards the future, um, we've seen things like stadium seating, 3D, 4DX, food and alcohol being served, et cetera. What do you think are like some, some other developments that may be happening now or might be happening in the future to keep theaters particularly uh, unique spaces? Well, first they're not happening now because we don't have any money to buy anything. But when we come out of the pandemic, we'll get back on track of, of trying to make sure we offer the best experience to watch a movie possible anywhere. And a big part of that is the technologies that we use to show the movie both the image and the sound. Um, and there's a lot of work that's gone into that, right? The migration from film to digital, although you can, you can, you can debate with the Quentin Tarantino's and the Chris Nolan's whether or not that was a good migration as a, as a quality of the image thing. Digital cinema has allowed us to do all kinds of things on the quality of projection, the variability of the programming. Um, but there's more coming. I mean, we're, we're looking at increasing dynamic range. We're looking at, you know, do LED screens, do something different than rear end projection. Um, the sound systems continue to get better and better and better. So certainly in terms of the image and the sound, not right now during the pandemic when we literally have no money to buy anything, but we will return to making sure we're on the cutting edge of the, the, the experience of watching the movie in a cinema and what you hear around you while you're watching it. Beyond that, um, you know, I, I've been surprised in my career about the innovations that have taken off and those that didn't, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we first got digital cinema, we thought alternative content would be a big deal, right? We'd be showing sporting events and we'd be showing concerts and we'd be making as much money off alternative content as we do off of movies. Here's what people like watching movies in movie theaters and not necessarily as many of those other things. With some exceptions, the opera Netflix, yeah, I mean, opera has worked tremendously well. Who would have thought when we converted to digital cinema, people in Omaha, Nebraska would show up in tuxedos, buy champagne at our concessions counters and watch the opera. I mean, yeah. bizarre. Um, we, we, but the we, one that came- We the, do the Met Operas on campus in, in, our, in, our, yeah. in our big theater and they're wildly popular. Amazing. The one, the one that just completely shocked me though was big luxury recliners. The, in terms of the impact on the business, the most important change in the last decade in terms of driving more people to the cinemas to pay a higher, a higher price. Particularly in America, Americans love their big recliners because AMC years back, I was in a, I was in a meeting uh, with the AMC executives in Kansas City and they said, we got this crazy idea where we're going to take this uh, old, really underperforming theater and we're not going to make any changes. We're just going to rip out all the seats and put in luxury recliners. And I said, you're crazy. This is like, you know, Kansas City trying to tell the world what's a good idea. Um, and then it just exploded. Mm. And re by reducing your seat count by over half, people were doubling their ticket sales. Just, it made no sense at all. So recliners took off. Um, high-end food and beverage is the more recent one that really, really, really changed the business. Um, and again, it's for a different type of location and a different type of clientele, but, uh, but really good food and really good beer and wine now is a big deal at a lot of cinemas. So we'll keep trying all these things and offering choices and high-end experiences and, and continuing to drive the experience. Can you tell whoever makes the rumble seats that it needs an on-off switch? Because... <laughs> I've been to some of these theaters where it's so out of place for the movie that you're watching. Yeah, so on it. 4, 4D is bizarrely controversial. Um, and it's also geographic. In Korea and Mexico, they love shaken seats. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I've been to a cinema in Seoul to watch a 4D experience. And it's, I mean, it's like, a massive amusement ride. They they love it. In some places in LA, I mean, in, in the US, they love it. In some places they don't. I've watched the numbers at LA Live ever since they put it in their first um, uh, movable seat auditorium for years. Um, so it's, some people love it, some people hate it. But again, it's about offering choices, right? It's about giving options. And uh, that's an option that some people really like and some people can't stand. Mm. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard of these 
uh, extraordinary cinemas where they're like, it's not just the rumble seat, but there's like experiences where, you know, maybe like the old Honey, I Shrunk the Kids experience uh, at, at, was it Universal or Disney? Where um, you get stuff like sprayed at you. It feels like a high-tech odorama. Um, what what are what are they doing in Korea and 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 China that that hasn't arrived here yet? Well, they're doing all that. Um, the, the the complete 4D experience is not just the seats move. Uh, it's all this other stuff happens too. Um, and and uh, CJCGV is a company that's based in Korea but has an office in LA and has a range of these systems. There are lots of them. I shouldn't just pick on one company, but. Um, but they're out there, and and uh, you know, uh, in terms of the American marketplace, those things will help on the margins. Um, but and and like I said, we'll continue to offer choices. But literally, the two things that matter to our business are really good movies with a window, and a comfortable viewing experience. So that that means the sight and sounds got to be great. The seats have to be comfortable. The food's got to be okay, right? Um, and if you have a if you have a good experience and you have a good movie, we're always going to do well as a business outside the areas of a pandemic. But the, all these other things are, you know, they're they're nice value adds on the margins for some folks. Um, all right, I won't keep you too much longer, but I wanted to ask this question about, um, uh, I guess, the blockbuster versus. Uh, you know, mid-range films. Um, the profitability of global blockbusters seems to have completely erased mid-level budget films and forced indie cinema almost entirely into alternative exhibition formats. Is there any thinking at NATO around elevating films that aren't blockbusters just to keep the health of filmmaking alive artistically, even though they aren't making the mega blockbuster gazillions of a Marvel, Marvel type franchise? Yes, uh, a very, very important question. And um, theater owners love smaller independent films that catch on, right? Um, for a lot of reasons. We need diverse content that apply appeals, sorry, to diverse audiences. Um, and four quadrant blockbusters don't satisfy everybody. So a range of films in budget size and, and genre and appeal is vitally important to the business. Um, and secondly, we get better film terms on smaller movies, right? We just have to pay the studios a lot of money when we rent their big blockbusters. Mm -hmm. And so when, it, when a smaller movie from a smaller company takes off, it's great because we keep a higher percentage cut of that ticket price. So it's, it's good for the patrons, it's good for the business. Um, we love a mix of films. What's happened in the last 10 years, the blockbusters have done great. There are more movies making, you know, whatever the threshold is, 100 million, 200, 500 million globally um, every year, except for the pandemic, of course. And little independent films have done really well. Um, call them awards contenders, call them whatever. Um, we're seeing local foreign films travel better. So the really small stuff's working. What's what we're what we're missing is the mid-budget films, mm -hmm. and and the portion of our ticket sales for that category has shrunk considerably, and that is that is a challenge to us. Um, the the thirty million dollar movie that really takes off and does a ton of business, and and we're not quite sure why. Several companies have focused on the middle. Um, STX comes to mind, a great you know concept, and they've had a couple really great movies. We hope that their model takes off. Um, Lionsgate does a, quite a few of these, you know, middle middle budget movies and so do others. I'm, I shouldn't pick on, now I'm gonna get calls from everybody else saying, why did you talk about STX and Lionsgate? But um, but the, but the, I'm more worried about the middle budget movies than I am the independents. The independents, we, we got some, we got some cinema owners that love independent film and will give any of them a shot. And, um, and the, the art house crowd doesn't need an advertising campaign. They find their movies, they read online, they search out what's great and they go find them. Um, but the, the middle tier is my bigger concern. Uh, well, just to wrap up, I wanted, and feel free to, to not answer this question. What is your ideal film viewing experience in the Los Angeles market? 
Yes, this is the way that you get like one member really happy and <laughs> 10 to quit. You don't have to um, say, you don't have to say the name of the chain. Just give us a zip code. <laughs> no, it's okay. I I I mean for 20 years I have spent 12 weeks a year in Los Angeles. I have a house in Burbank. Um pre-pandemic, my wife and I lived a bi-coastal life and go back and forth. Um, man, I haven't been back to Burbank in a year, which is weird because I usually spend 12 weeks a year there. Um, so I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, even though our headquarters is here in Washington, D.C. I go to a lot of movies in L.A. And there, uh, other than the fact that they're currently closed, you guys are lucky in L.A. because you have one of the greatest ranges of movie going experiences anywhere in the country. Um, and so my favorite experience depends on what kind of mood I'm in, right? If I really want to feel the buzz of a big blockbuster coming out and sense what the crowds are thinking and what the reaction is. And because my house is in Burbank, I'll go to the AMC in Burbank, right? And also they got a Dolby Cinema there. Dolby Vision's a fantastic experience. Um, I can hear the phone call coming from Cinemark right now about why I'm talking about the AMC in Burbank. Um, but then, but then if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, um, if it's a more sophisticated film or if it's a, um, like if it's, if it's, I really want a great glass of wine and, and my wife and I want to go and watch an, a different type of movie than any of the arc lights are, uh, Sherman Oaks. I like, um, like the one in Hollywood too. Um, not a big fan of Cinerama Dome other than the fact that it's historical because I think it's a weird experience, but the other part of the arc light's like fantastic. Um, and I've just been, I've just had so many great movie going experiences in Los Angeles that I'm really going to get in trouble. Um, I like, I like, I like going to movie, movie cinemas that are part of a big shopping mall too, because you get the sense of what people are doing with their evenings. Are they, are they going to, are they going to eat at our cinema or are they going to go eat at dinner at the mall? first and come over and so i'll go over to the grove and see what that combination's like um there's just so many great experiences so many great experiences in la um yeah the well i, I mean the mark down by the airport's fantastic um you know even some of the older like you know some of the some of the older art houses in, in la are, are are great too vista yeah I mean, and of course the the egyptian um, one, okay, one last thing, just because, you know, as you know, I, I, I'm a, a, I grew up in DC and, you know, I, my youth was really spent in KB theaters and uh, uh, Cineplex Odeons, none of which exist in DC anymore. Um, but I, I heard that the Uptown shut down, which is the most devastating theatrical news I have heard in years. Um, I wanted to know if there's any information you can share about that. It's awful, um, and 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 the AMC and Mazda Gallery is shutting down permanently too. Washington is in trouble because it is one of the only places in the country that has not been open for one single day since the pandemic started. Because our mayor and our health department are cuckoo birds, and have opened up viewing rooms in museums, but not movie theaters. Don't even get me started about how upset I am with the DC government right now, but. So the Uptown, for those of you who aren't from Washington, D.C., is a big classic theater on uh, Connecticut Avenue in uh, Cleveland Park in Washington, D.C. And it's within walking distance of my daughter's high school. And she wow. and her friends would go in mobs to that theater to watch, what was her favorite theater she watched there? Gravity, I think she said, was, was the most impressive on that gigantic screen. Um, there I am helping Warner Brothers again. I, I, I keep picking favorites. Um, and it's sad that it closed down, right? And I don't know if, if there's going to be a rescue campaign or a funding thing or, um, it's an institution and, and that's a, that's a bummer. It's the largest capacity movie theater in Washington DC or was, and, uh, that one's sad. So, yeah. We, uh, I was at with my high school, your daughter's high school is, uh, when the Star Wars movies were re-released and there was a line from the uptown on Connecticut, up uh, up the side street, not Macomb, but like whatever that one by the library is that went almost all the way up to Wisconsin. And we used to like take shifts during study hall to go stand in line. I am I mean, that's to me, that's the, the greatest movie going experience I've ever had, so. Yeah, balcony, 
yeah tons of seats fantastic yeah all right that's that's enough insider baseball on dc movie theaters john thank you so much i'm sorry i know there were a bunch of other questions but uh um you know in in the uh uh since it is later over in dc i want to allow you to get back to your life so thank you so much for joining us and doing this. Um, and uh, I really hope to uh, welcome you to campus, you know, when you're back in LA sometime. Well, thanks for having me on. I can't wait to get back to LA physically. I miss the place. Um, but if anybody's got questions you didn't get to, jf at natodc.com. jf at natodc.com. Happy to do e-talk with you. Fantastic. Thank you so right. much and take care. Thanks. Bye all.